So on that, I want to go to Barbara. So are we really a country that cares? Are we uh, healing? Do we have an ethics of care? What's our connection to country and, and spirit? Barbara, we'd love to hear from you. Thanks very much. And um, I think Murray, you stole some of my thunder because uh, <laughs> I'm going to be talking about the Solomon Islands. Um, I'd like to begin first by acknowledging the Wurundjeri people, the traditional owners of the land on who we're meeting today and pay my respects to their elders, both past and present. Um, my contribution is slightly different. I've got a very short story to tell you, reflecting the voices of the West RARA Rokitani Kenny women from the Solomon Islands. They're from one of the 900 islands that make up the Solomon Islands where I've been living for uh, the last 18 months. Uh, and the Solomon Islands is a country that is amongst our nearest neighbours. It takes about the same time to get there as it does to fly to Perth. And as Murray says, we really shouldn't forget uh, our nearest Pacific neighbours as we set our sights on Asia. I've been volunteering with this group of fantastic women for the last 18 months and uh, through that work uh, and working very closely with a fabulous woman called Dr Alice Arahita Pollard, we've uh, conducted a very simple project to produce two very simple booklets that I've uh, got a couple of copies here today to help women to learn how to budget, uh, how to save money and how to bank. A micro project but with really uh, long-term and kind of transformational benefits that I think Murray uh, referred to. Sometimes we call it the economic empowerment of women. But these women were well on their way before I arrived. They'd been operating uh, savings clubs for about 15 years. And what this meant was the women travelling uh, around the islands, stopping at villages, collecting the savings of women living in these villages often only a dollar, two dollars, five dollars, Solomon dollars that is, so a few cents in Australian dollars that they'd saved. As they went around it would amass and they'd end up often with thousands of dollars uh, that they'd collect and they'd sleep with it uh, in a basket under their head until they could get back by canoe to Honiara to put it in the bank for the women. Why were they doing this? Because in Solomon Islands infrastructure is so poor as you can see here, this is uh, an airport that uh, feeds one of the tourist destinations in the Solomon Islands. And banking services are really virtually uh, non-existent, with only about a quarter of the population having a bank account, and those that do, not really trusting the banks very much. Most people earn their um, cash through informal selling. Um, they make baskets and those kinds of things. Most people still live in rural villages. They're growing their own food and uh, selling it. So the kind of issues we're talking about today, such as food security and climate change, are of great importance to them, particularly as some of the islands are uh, sinking. So the women are um, saving money, and then they hide it from the men. And they hide it from the men because the men spend it on the wrong kinds of things, like betel whereas the women spend it on the right kind of things, like education for their uh, children. So we often think of things moving slowly in Pacific countries, and that's true. And certainly uh, access to services is um, a big issue. Uh, less than half the population has access to electricity two-thirds of them rely on um, a community tap or a standpipe for drinking water. But some things are changing quickly. We've found women um, adopting things like technology and, uh, and ATMs. Um, and in the last three years, we've seen a tripling in the population having access to mobile phones. So as Murray said, 75% of them now have access to mobile phones. We've been running workshops with uh, the women in urban slums and other places, helping them learn how to save money. And it has been transformational, um, as Murray said. Uh, a young woman came along to a workshop and we asked her why she was saving. She said, I'm saving to help my parents pay my school fees so I can go to school. We think there's uh, great potential out of what has been a very small project. 
We were boosted recently by the Australian Governor-General coming to launch uh, these booklets for the women. It happened in the National Parliament and I just have to say what a fantastic day it was to see the Parliament filled for the first time with women when there is not a woman holding a seat in Parliament currently in the Solomon Islands. A great empowering moment for those women. So my message is really simple. Um, as we set our long-term vision on Asia, please don't forget uh, our friends in the Pacific who need our skills and our expertise and those people-to-people -people links that Ken mentioned. And secondly, if you're looking for a safe investment, I'd say women in the Pacific are a sure bet. <laughs> um, they have a proven track record, low risk, and they provide great returns. Thanks very much. Thanks, Barbara. Sounds like a new definition of soft and smart power. Steve, I'll go to you. We've had voices from Australia and the world. Um, we have His Excellency Mr Khotan, Dr Prakash, and of course uh, Dr Eon with our um, exciting World Chinese Economic Forum. So it's really a perspective from the world. How would you like to introduce that? Well, I'd like to invite uh, Manju, Dr Manju uh, Prakash, who's made the special journey from India to be with us as the Assistant Secretary General of the peak industry body of uh, uh, FICI, the Federation of Chambers of Commerce in India. You're most welcome. Your perspective. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, I'd just like to say a few things and I'd like to mention in the very beginning. Could, like excuse Steve me, in, Matt, could you just hold the microphone sure. a little closer? Thank you. Thank you. Just like Steve introduced me from being from the Chamber of Commerce, so I'd like to set the tone in the beginning that I would be concentrating on the business side of it rather than going into the strategic and other parts of it. And that would be my photo for this. The 21st century has brought a change with focus on innovation, research and development, collaboration of knowledge and skills, and this can only be tapped to the fullest extent with the change in mindset, which will be the key for responding to challenges and direct person-to-person -person contact, which even Ken Henry mentioned when he was speaking. And we from India believe that this would be very, very important with the Asian century being on the forefront because experience will be the quickest and most effective way to change the attitudes to the person-to-person -person contacts. <clears throat> the Asian century or Pacific century has become a catchphrase that places great emphasis on economic dynamism of the world as we see today. And if you look at the study done by the ADB, <clears throat> which is Asia 2050, realizing the Asian century, it says <clears throat> that Asia continues to grow on a recent trajectory. It could account for 51% of world GDP by 2050, compared with just 27% in 2010. <clears throat> and by 2050, the East Asian and South Asian economies will increase 20 times, bringing with it a rise in standard of living. And as projected by the Human Development Index, India's Human Development Index will approach 0.8 and East Asia 0.94, just making them very, very close to EU and the US. So you would see how things are changing and very, very fast. The middle class residing in Asia is also going to be increasing from 28% in 2009 by about 66% by 2030. The growth of the Asian middle class means a massive increase in consumption and spending on imported goods and services, and supply of which Australia is well placed to provide. Given that the global economy is dynamic and ever-changing, and hence recipes of the past may not able to drive it. So we need to be very, very sure and very, very fast in how we want to interact and change. Because the growing economies of the Australia and Asia can only compete or become closer to each other if we start realizing and changing and adapting to the needs of the Asian century. Australia needs to get integrated with Asia, given the backdrop that the center of economic activity is becoming more Asia-oriented. Uh, if I may quote here, the former Australian Prime Minister, Kevin Ritz, whence he once described Australia to be a nation whose origins lie firmly in the West, but whose geopolitical and geoeconomic circumstances are shaped in the large part by its location in the East. 
And even if we see today, Australia's trade and investment with Asia now outweighs that with America and Europe. Although this is more so as a trader than as an investor with Asia. And there is a lot of scope for Asia to get engaged with Asia as being one of the largest investors too. Uh, let's say, if I may simplify it by saying that from the Indian's perspective, let's go beyond the three C's, which is cricket, commonwealth, and curry, to see which is commerce. There's a huge <laughs> scope there. And as a business representative, I like to underline, this is what is the need of the hour. Of course, it may not be wrong to state that strategically also, Australia needs to play an important role with Asia. The Indian Ocean is Australia's backyard, playing major role in transporting energy from the oil and gas-rich Persian Gulf to Australia's principal trading partners, China and Japan. And with each passing year, these and other Asian, Asian economic powers are becoming more dependent on free passage of oil from the Indian Ocean. I'll do a quick run between the India-Australia relationship, because Australia is the fifth largest two-way trading partner of Australia, seventh largest service trade partner of Australia, fourth largest export market in 2011, constituting 6.4% of its exports, China, 26.4%, Japan, 19.1%, and Republic of Korea, 9.2%. It's the second largest market for coal and copper mines, and the third largest market for lead and wood. I would just like to mention that from FICI, we had this first CEO forum between India and Australia. And we had the big companies from Australia and the big companies from India engaged. And they came to the forefront and how the two countries can engage further. They brought forward four or five issues which are of concern and how we can engage deeply. The first and foremost was fast tracking the Comprehensive Economic and Cooperation Agreement, SICA, which would help in liberalizing trade in goods and services and investment. Safety standards beginning with the mining, manufacturing, construction, and transport sectors. Repatriation of dividends, particularly issues relating to steel and coal, an IT sector that is movement of professionals. And of course, still skill development, carbon and mining tax, which is a detrimental both to the Australian as well as the Indian investors. I would like to say that from India, the Australians who are getting engaged are not necessarily in the higher uh, brackets, for example, it's actually companies which are even ranging from $5 million to $50 million, because the opportunities there are immense. If I will just like to quote and simply say that, you know, you have uh, Melbourne GRG International, which operates ATM for banks in Australia. It has recently won a contract to run the payment distribution system for a public system known as Narega. It's a government-run uh, fund which is distributed across India, and that's gone to an Australian company, looking at how it runs the ATMs very successfully in Australia. Then there's the innovation and skill and financial services, which are the other sectors which are looked after for collaboration. The development of new and clean process technologies for making energy efficient vehicles based on alternate fuels. Uh, Cochlear has brought bionic ear technology to India, and as Australia has proximity to the Asian market, Australia needs to be competitive in the agri-produce or food producing units as demand is increasing for these items with the increasing middle class with large disposable incomes. Technology transfer for agriculture and food production sector by Australia allows for a strong value add position as food security becomes more of a focus and opportunities for investment in better packaging and cold chain infrastructure. 